All right, I'm going to go to Psalm 13. That's what I was going to read Sunday. <clears throat> Psalm 13. How long will thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord. God, light mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Father, we come to you tonight thankful for this passage of Scripture. And Father, we ask that you never forget us and never hide your face from us. But Lord, we ask that if we know that you don't do that, but if we feel that you do that, Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and, and allow us to rejoice in the salvation that you have given us. And Lord, we ask, we ask that you give us the ability to rejoice in how you do deal with us. And Father, we ask that you continue to watch over us here in this congregation, Lord, no matter how large or how small you decide to make it. Father, we ask that you just continue to watch over us and continue to have our pastor bring faithful messages. And we ask that you watch over him as he studies. And we ask that you just watch over us here tonight and all that couldn't be with us. And we ask that you watch over us again until we meet back again on Sunday. We ask this in Christ's name. Good evening. Our hymn will be 141, Hail Sovereign Love, 141. Justice cried with frown. 
Interposition. What does that word interposition mean? If you look up in a dictionary, it says something to the effect of someone or something coming between two things, two objects, two persons, two groups. If your son and your nephew got into a little scuffle and you came in between them, you'd be interposing yourself. You'd be putting yourself between them and telling them to calm down, calm down, boys. When we saw an example of interposition not too long ago in the scriptures, we were in Genesis 14, and it was when Abraham was on his way back from having defeated the king Chedor Laomer of of Elam, I think it was, and, and the, the three kings in league with him, and he had conquered them and was bringing back all the persons that they took from Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities and the riches there. And they were told there that it was Bera, king of Sodom, went out to meet Abram. He went out to meet him. And then a little while longer, we're told that he said to Abram, you take you take all the riches, just give me the persons. But there's a space between there. There's a little space between him going out and him opening his mouth to talk to Abram. What happened? Melchizedek interposed himself, coming with bread and wine, that heavenly bread and wine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before that wicked man, Bera, king of Sodom, could open his mouth, and entice Abram with that very enticing offer to make him wealthy. All he had to do was just be his man, be in league with him, and give him the persons. That's all he had to do. But when Melchizedek interposed with the blood of Christ, with the body and blood of Christ, Abram was strengthened. And Abram said, nope, I don't want it. You keep your riches for yourself. I don't want any of it. I don't want any of it. And so that gives us a picture of interposition. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for all his people. He interposed himself. He, put, he shed his blood. He came between him and the just wrath of God, which was against us for our sins and our iniquities. We would justly be punished for our sins, but Christ interposed himself he came between us and justice and he paid the price and he delivered us justly from the hands of god's justice and gave us wrath uh, and gave us life and salvation this is the, he, he atoned for our sins and we have life through him now tonight i want to look at a psalm with you that glorifies christ who interposes himself and comes between us and our enemies. We're going to look at a psalm that's, that glorifies Christ who comes between his people and their enemies. And tonight, that psalm is 124. Psalm 124. 
This psalm is titled the Song of Degrees of David. And that means David penned this psalm when the Lord had delivered Israel from some great threat. Some great threat of destruction was threatening Israel to destroy Israel and to bring them to nothing. Now, the specific danger we're never told about. We don't know what the specific danger was. We don't know if it was the danger of an enemy from without threatening the borders of Israel and coming in and threatening to overthrow them and take their land and destroy the people. We don't know if it was an enemy from within who sought to overthrow David and to bring the people into ruin, such as what Absalom did. But it is certain that David understood, and he wanted the, to understand. He would sing this psalm and sing the, the praise to the Lord for what he had done. He wants us to understand had the enemy had their way with us. We would have certainly been destroyed had the Lord not interposed himself between his people and their enemy and delivered the people. And I think that it doesn't mention what it was, why he wrote this, because it transcends time. It's for the church in all ages. It's for all of us to know that, that there's an enemy that would destroy us, that would bring us to utter and absolute ruin, except the Lord Jesus Christ has taken it upon himself to interpose himself and to deliver us from the destruction of our enemies. Now let's read the first five verses. Psalm 124, beginning in verse 1. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. I remember, probably a couple of decades ago now, I was sitting on an airplane for business or something at that time, and I had some time on my hands, and so I was thumbing through one of those airplane magazines that are in the back of the seats. And there was a story in there about a big wave surfer big wave surfer and this man liked to serve surf big waves and he had a crew a team that helped him locate these giant waves and he was accustomed to surfing waves something the size of 25 feet or so and that's big that's big and those are things out in the ocean they're not crashing on the beach they're crashing way way out in the ocean and they located some place out in the south pacific somewhere and they went out there and apparently these waves are so large and take so long to swell and grow that you have to tug the man on the surfboard with a motorboat to get up to the proper speed in order to catch that wave properly. Well, he caught that wave and this thing was massive. I don't remember if it was, it was something much, much, much larger than what he was accustomed to surfing and he hit that wave and it wasn't long before himself and the crew realized this man is in grave grave danger and they thought he was going to die out there but after some time and I don't remember all the details but they pulled him into the boat safe and sound this man was alive and he begins to tell them and he begins to to talk excitedly about what had happened and the next thing that happened he began to weep he began to cry and weep because it all hit him that he was nearly consumed by that water he was nearly drowned and destroyed and crushed and busted apart by that water so that this thrill-seeking well, very experienced surfer who knew what he was doing out there realized I should have been consumed and destroyed. I shouldn't be here right now talking to you. I should be dead. Now, I don't remember 
this man ever giving glory to God for his life. But David, the psalmist here, makes sure that we know who it is that delivers us from certain destruction. And he gives all the glory to God. You whose life should have been ended, you who should be destroyed by no sense, no understanding of who the true and living God is, you that now know him, it's because God has delivered you. It's because God has been gracious to you through his starling son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so believers know that. Believers are made to know that my salvation, the only reason why I call upon the name of the Lord, the only reason why I believe in him, the only reason why I'm here this day speaking to you is because God was gracious and merciful to deliver me, to interpose with his son, to come between me and certain death and deliver me from that death. And so believers declare they glory in the Lord. And now the psalmist says at the end of verse 2, when men rose up against us. And so here the Lord is showing us that the character, the adversary here of which this psalm speaks is first of men. At least as we understand it, it's of men. Men is used to show us how great the threat is against our lives, you that believe the Lord Jesus Christ. You that boast in the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, men of this world hate that message. The natural, carnal man despises the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which gives God all the glory and none of the glory to man you talk about that and you speak of what God has done and you press that and you continue to give him all the glory and you're going to anger the carnal natural man and he will be your enemy this character of men is first called the waters and there is there's we see in revelation where the waters are described as peoples and nations they're called waters in scriptures and then those waters, that trickling water, becomes a stream. They're described as a stream, proud waters, which would overtake us and destroy us. They grow and they increase and it gets worse and worse. And that's true. The more you press it, the more they press against you. We remember seeing Lot in Sodom. All he did was mention to them that their works were wicked. All he did was use that one word and say, what you're doing is wicked. What you want to do to these men in my house is wicked. And for that, they were ready to kill him. They were ready to rip him apart and destroy him just for speaking the truth. Just for speaking that truth, they wanted to destroy him. And had the Lord not intervened to save his people, they would swallow us up. And we would be overwhelmed. And we would be overtaken with the proud waters we would be destroyed the pride of man would rise up in us as well and we would be destroyed and utterly fall away and be consumed as well now our soul it speaks of waters coming to the soul going over the soul in the most precious thing that we have is our soul it's not your spouse it's not your children it's not your possessions. The most precious thing you have is your soul. Your soul. Our Lord asks in Matthew 16, 26, For what is man profited? What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall he give? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You could be the king of the world, having all the riches all the power, all the influence, so, so that if anyone said to you, what are you doing? You could say, who are you to speak to me? Guard, take that man and put him to death. You could own the whole world and be king of the world, and yet, that what is that worth your soul? So that he said there, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing, if the whole world cannot be exchanged for your soul. If you can't go to God and say, Lord, 
I have all this world. I'll give it to you if you give me eternal life. He says, you can't, it's not worth it. It's not an equal balance. This whole world does not equate to the value of your soul. Of your soul. That's how precious, how valuable your eternal soul is. It, and this body does not compare. Our Lord said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't worry if they're threatening to, to take your body, to take your life. Don't let them have your soul. Don't give that up. Don't trade that in to, to spare your life because your life's going to... This is a, a raggedy old tent. It's fading away. It's full of holes. Let them take it. Let them take it. It's not worth your soul. It's not worth turning against the true and living God. So in this, in this sense, in the sense is here that this hatred against us is from men of this world. It is men who are patterned after this world. They're, they're, they go according to this world's fashions and the ways of darkness, and their hatred is for God and his people, his people who love him and love his Savior and love his salvation and bear witness to what he has done. And it's true. We see in Scripture how the hatred of the Lord's people is worse for them. And as far as men in this world are concerned, they hate them most of all. So that when you come to Nebuchadnezzar, they fired up that furnace seven times more hot because they would not bow the knee and worship their idol. And so they fired that thing up seven times hotter. But the Lord intervened. And, and they were willing, if the Lord didn't, they were willing to lay down their lives. And, and that's what we're called to do, to, to, not be, to, not, to not lay down our lives there. So they threatened to take and destroy all that would seem precious to man. And God says, he tells us, do not fear them. They are not able to kill your soul. They can't touch it. They can touch the body, but they can't touch the soul. And so they're fierce. They're fierce. The enemy means your destruction they mean your destruction but jehovah is your god almighty the el shaddai jehovah is your god and he has undertaken the cause of his people to deliver their souls from eternal ruin now if you look at those first two verses one more time there it said you see some italicized words if you have a King James Version, and it shows you that. Those words, it had and been, they're not in there. They're not in there. And the translators gave those words to smooth it out, but it's actually meant to be choppy. It's meant to be like that man in the boat who was almost overwhelmed and overtaken by those waters. They're saying, if not Jehovah, if not Jehovah, had not Jehovah stepped in and delivered us, we'd be destroyed. They're excited. They're excited because they see and they understand we had almost been destroyed. It's a, an intense moment when you see it. When you see how close, how near your, your life is to being taken, it's an intense moment. And that's how we are. He says in verse 6, Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. That is what he's saying there. None can harm you. None can harm you. None can touch you except God permit it. And he's showing us here how that whatever the Lord permits, he will not let them take your soul who have cast all your care upon him and trust him and look to him for grace and mercy and help in time of need. He'll not let the enemy destroy your soul and there's times when when we feel like it will be over there's times each of you that that have any, any experience in the lord you know there's there's times when you thought this is it this is it i am going to be brought down i'm going to be destroyed i've turned this way when i should have turned that way and it's over it's over i'm i'm going to 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 be dead before too long here well the lord shows us through the scriptures that we're in good company 
you're in good company. You that have seen and, 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 and faced that death, but trusted in the Lord and called out to the Lord to save you, you're in good company. Paul once said in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8 through 10, he said, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. We thought these idolaters are going to destroy us. They're going to beat us. They're going to stone us. They're going to kill us. They're going to take our lives. We thought, surely, this is the end. This is it. But, he says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. So that even if they did have their way and took our lives, we know our God is the God who raises the dead. He gives life, life eternal. We're not trusting in the life of this body. We trust in the life giver, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 10, who hath delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And so more often than not, we see how the Lord delivers us. And he allows those waters to come right up so that we see, so that we despair of any confidence in the flesh, that we would know that God has done this. God has saved us. God has protected us. God has interposed his blood, and he has determined to give me life. Not what man would do. Not what they would do. Not what their choice is. What God has determined. That's what it is. That we would know and glory in the Lord. That we would know to trust him. That we would know, have no confidence in this flesh, believe him. Follow him. Trust him. He's able to do whatsoever needs to be done to deliver his people. And he does this in measure. To some in greater degree than others. But it's always for the good of the body of his people. It's always for the good of the body of his people. So that we learn... I ain't going to trust the flesh, but I've seen how the Lord, when you, when you look back and you examine, you see the Lord's done this. The Lord's done this. And you can imagine when they came through Asia and despaired of life and yet were delivered, you can imagine Paul and his companions saying, if not Jehovah, if not the Lord, if not our Father, if not the Lord Jesus Christ, if he didn't do this, but he did. <laughs> he did. And here we are. Here we are. He brought us through. He provided for us. He, he brought us through that, that valley of the shadow of death and gave us life. And so it is that when our God rises up, he drives the enemy back. They come in forcefully and, fierce, and fiercely because they would destroy you. They despise you. They hate you because you love the Lord and you give glory to him. And they come in that the Lord rises up for his people and he drives them back. As Isaiah says in Isaiah 59, Verse 19, in the second half, he said, When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. It reminds me, when I was a, a little boy, I would watch, you know, on TV, you had very limited channels, and so I watched a lot of older movies, and I remember all those times where the army would come in, and they'd storm that castle. When they got in that, that, those gates, and they broke that thing down, they were in. There was no getting them out. But there was one movie I remember, I don't remember what it was, but they got in there and it looked like all was lost. But they rallied and they drove them right back out. And that's what the Lord does. He raises the standard, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by that standard, by that ensign, he drives back the enemy, drives them out. Drives them out from your midst, drives them out from your own heart, the enemy of our heart and this flesh. The Lord is able to deliver his people lest we should be destroyed and consumed by those waters. Now, let me bring your attention to two more metaphors that the psalmist gives us here. Let's go to verse 6 again. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. So here, Israel, the Israel of God, is likened to a helpless prey. You can imagine a little lamb or a little sheep and they're ready to be devoured by the teeth the rav the teeth of a ravenous beast that would rip them apart and destroy them and here 
By this we begin to see the character of the one behind those men. We begin to see those that, that it's not just those men, but they're under, they've been taken captive. And they're, they're going the course of this world, the course of the way of the wicked. And they're doing his, his bidding and the hatred that he has for us is in them. They're doing the lusts of their father. It says they would do to Christ. And our Lord tells us of their father that he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so this is the one of whom Peter warns us, saying, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil go as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's our enemy. And that's what's going on here. But remember, the Lord has not given you his beloved people. When Christ laid down his life, he's not given you to be a prey to be destroyed and plucked out of the hand of God and, and lost forever. He, he has your soul in his hand. You're his precious possession. You're his inheritance. And so he won't lose you. So the enemy comes against you. Second, in verse 7, our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Now here our precious soul is likened to a bird. And in this context we see that the bird is weak. The bird is weak. This bird is fooled. This bird is tricked into the trap. It's taken in the snare and it's rather easy. It's rather easy for that bird to be taken and ensnared by the fowler. How come? Well, the, the fowler knows the birds. He studies the birds. He knows exactly the birds. He knows these birds hop along the ground. These birds are looking for worms, and these birds here are looking for seed, and these birds here like fruit. And he knows the birds. He knows what ensnares them and what entraps them and what lures them into his snare so that he knows the best way to catch each particular bird. You know, we see this, right? Some birds are attracted to the decoys of other birds that look like them but are fake. Some birds are attracted to, to the, the, the duck whistle that sounds just like them, right? A lot of ducks are taken just because people put out decoys and they blow that whistle and it attracts them and they come down and they're taken in the snare and they lose their lives. Right? And I know that there's other birds that are brought near. Michelle and I have some bird feeders and we put out some good high-end bird food. Right? It's got good seed, and it's got bigger seeds and sunflower seeds and other kinds of seeds and it's got little fruit bits and interesting things that different birds find tasty. And so they're brought in by the dainties and brought near. And if you want to get them closer, I just put a little bit out on the deck and I can see them come right on up to the glass outside my door. And you can just lower them right in if you want them. <laughs> and so just like that, the fowler knows what attracts us. He knows what catches our eye and what interests us, and he puts it out. He sets it out for the trap. And I have chickens, and I used to have a net over the chickens. I was worried about hawks, although that net's down, and they, they're not interested in them, thankfully. But, but if a bird got in through the side fence, because it was a little wider, if I came around the corner and I startled that bird, that bird would fly up and try and get away and would bounce off the, the net over and over and over again until I calmed down and let it, let it get, get itself and, and fly out the side again safely. But had I had a net, that's, you could just throw that net over there and, and snare them. And they'd be trapped in that net and unable to get out. And so the fowler knows how to tempt us and ensnare us and entrap us. And so... We need salvation. We need the Lord to come in and to undo that trap, to set us free, to deliver us from the snare of the fowler. We don't have the wisdom. We're not able. Paul did say we're, we're, we're not unaware of his tricks. We're not unaware of how he works. We're not ignorant of his devices. But you'd be excused if you didn't recognize that same wisdom that Paul expressed in our day because 
we fall for the snares far too often than we care to admit to one another. And so we, we see just how easy we can be taken in the snare. And so the snare comes in many forms, and its intended end is to destroy us. But thanks be to God that that intended end, purpose for that, that fowler, is frustrated. And the Lord has destroyed him. And they're not able to come in unto your soul and to destroy you. Our Lord does marvelously in saving his people. Sometimes it's through the interposition of the gospel word to remind you again of what Christ has done, to show you again your inheritance. Sometimes he refreshes us with his spirit under that word, or sometimes he brings comfort from a brother or a sister who loves you and shows you that love and kindness and it reminds you of the grace and the mercy of God. Sometimes when we're being taken away by folly, the Lord brings a trial at the right time, some hardship, some difficulty, some affliction that turns us away from that, that snare. And though it seems hard to the flesh, yet it's good. It's good for the body because the Lord meant it and he means it for your good and your salvation. And so he's able to deliver us from the snares. Why? Well, as Paul said, God is faithful. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of, to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And so the point is, what our God has shown us is that the blood of Christ has redeemed us from all danger in all things, in our salvation from the first to the last. Before we ever knew, our God had provided for us in his darling son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's for his sake that we have life. It's for his sake that God takes such tender, careful care of each one of you and does not let you be destroyed by the enemy that would destroy you. He provides and protects he, he, he has fellowship with you. He comforts you. He provides for you in all your needs. This he does for Christ's sake. And that's because Christ came. He stood in the place of his people as our substitute. He bore the wrath of God that was our due. He satisfied God so that we go free. We go free. We should have been destroyed by the wrath of God. But we go free for Christ's sake. Look with me for a moment over in Psalm 69. Psalm 69. And this language here, we're just going to read the first two verses. And this is spoken of Christ. And here we see how that he enters into the same waters that we go into. We cry out, God save me, help me. Well, so our Savior says it. Save me, verse 1. Save me, O God. For the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. That's because Christ laid down his life as the sin atoning sacrifice for his people. Those waters came in unto his soul. Those waters overflowed him so that you and I can say, what the psalmist says in verse 4 and 5 of Psalm 124, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. If God didn't save us, then the proud waters had gone over our soul. But they didn't. You aren't consumed because Christ bore that wrath in your place. You that believe him, he bore the wrath of God to put away your sin, to put away that just wrath of God which would have taken your life forever and destroyed you justly before the wrath, under the wrath of God. But he paid the debt. He died our death and paid the debt we owed to give us life, to give us liberty, to set us free from the snare. And so now all those benefits continue, not only life eternal, but he provides for us in this life here. When, when the devil would consume us, when the men, who are under that, that spell of the devil would consume you. Christ provides. 
he provides. He gives salvation, life, and liberty. Such trust have we through Christ to God. He is all our salvation, brethren, all our salvation. And so the psalmist encourages our hearts with verse 8, Psalm 124, verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Well, we know who that is, don't we? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 3 of that chapter, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He's the creator. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our confidence. Our confidence is Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, who, who came in the likeness of this flesh because he loves us. We are his people given to him by the Father. And he laid down his life to give us life and deliver us from all the snares and all the things that would take us so that we have life and liberty, joy and rejoicing in him. Wherefore, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 19, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. I pray the Lord bless that word to your heart, brethren. You rejoice. You rejoice. You're not ensnared. You're, you're delivered from the fowler. You trust the Lord. You keep your eye on Christ. You look to him. He's your great God and Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation, abundantly, freely provided, and your darling Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Lord, we're ignorant in this flesh. We don't have any sense of the preciousness of our soul. But Lord, you do. And you took it upon yourself to provide for us in everything, Lord, that we should have life and liberty in you, with you, forever and ever, to all eternity. Lord, we thank you for this grace and this salvation. Lord, continue to exalt Christ in our hearts and before our eyes, Lord, we thank you. We don't, we're not asking for trouble, but Lord, when it does come, and when you purpose it and you bring it, Lord, we pray that you would continue to show us the very truth of these words, of what Christ has done in delivering his people, in providing for your people, in keeping us safe and protected in our God, Lord, that it would be good for all your people and all your body, that we would know the true and living God, and rejoice in him, and not this flesh, but in our God alone. It's in Christ's name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. All right, brother. Closing hymn will be, My Song Shall Be of Jesus, 146. 146.
Lord shall be achieved.